John Grisham is the author of many, many best-selling novels that largely take place within the American legal system. His new book, called The Judge's List, is a suspense novel about a lawyer who investigates a complaint against a very highly regarded judge. And then the lawyer discovers that the judge is actually a psychopath with a hit list of enemies. Before he took up writing, John Grisham was a trial lawyer and a member of the Mississippi State Legislature. And his books often expose the clubbiness of the legal system and the way that it can callously destroy the lives of innocent and powerless people. And he has a long-standing involvement with the Innocence Project in the United States, a movement dedicated to exonerating people who've been wrongfully convicted of major crimes. And they do this through DNA testing. I'm talking to John, who's in Virginia right now. Hello, John. Hello, hello. How are you doing? Very Down well, under. Very well, sir. Yes, a long way away, too. In the judges list, your book, your killer judge has this pristine public image. He's got an A plus rating from the bar. Why make a psycho killer a judge? What were you looking at there, John? Well, I had to choose someone uh, <laughs> <laughs> who wants to be a psychopath. It's fiction, okay? And I never, in the history of the United States, We've had, we have a pretty clean judiciary. Uh, we've, we've had very few criminal convictions of judges, but we had some. But never has a sitting judge been accused of murder. Everything else, every other crime you can think of, especially, you know, kickbacks and bribes and extortion, things like that, you would expect for judges to get caught up in. But uh, that's pretty, that's not unusual, but it has happened. But never murder. And to think that a sitting judge who is highly regarded could be, accused of murder or even guilty of not just one murder, but several murders. I thought it was a pretty intriguing idea. I wanted to write a book that would uh, hopefully frighten the readers, uh, something I rarely do. So it was a departure. Uh, There's no great issue uh, involved in this book. Uh, Most of my books have some type of exploration of a great injustice or an issue that is troubling the system. Uh, so I took the lighter route. I uh, just wrote about a judge who kills people. I remember reading Alan Moore, who wrote the brilliant graphic novel From Hell, which was about the Jack the Ripper murders. And in writing about the murder of uh, Marie Kelly, he, he said that to recreate that moment and the strange ritual around it took him right out in his mind to the furthest edges of, of existence, to one of, you know, it's about as strange a place as you can ever go to. Did you feel that when you go and exploring, you, when you have to sort of tread into the kind of, the psychology of that kind of a killer? No, I keep my distance. I, I keep a balance of uh, what I research, what I read and where I go. I, I just, th- this guy was not driven by sexual deviations or sexual uh, hangups. Uh, He was just driven by this weird sense of retribution, the need to get revenge. But no, I I, I, I never get that too deep in to my characters because I don't want to. I I, I want to forget these people as soon as the book's finished. (laughs) Your stories often betray, like I said, the legal world in your part of the United States. It's a very clubby place. And I suppose that's because... You know, you know people in a small town for a long while, you have that extension of trust. But is it as clubby as it seems, and can that be a problem? The judicial system is pretty clubby because you, you're you talking about a small percentage of the population. Even though we have a million lawyers, we have 330 million people. But the lawyers and judges all know each other, usually hang out with each other, a lot of them come out of the same law firm, same law schools, same offices of prosecutors. And yeah, it's pretty clubby. I'm not sure that's always bad. It just depends on the individual judge. What we have in this country, though, what I don't like, we have elected judges. And when you have elected judges, as we do in 35 states, uh, then politics enters into every aspect of the judge's life from from election and re-election from the decision uh, how to rule in certain cases political fallout becomes a factor that it should not be there and in many cases these people run for these offices and they they have to become politicians they have to make promises they have to raise money they take money from 
from future litigants who might come before their courts. Huh. It's 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 a it's a it's a bad system, and we've had we've had several cases uh, in, in certain states where people running for re-election to the state supreme court knew some of the cases that were coming uh, down the pipeline uh, in the appellate process, and they they would t- they took money from the corporations, the big corporations, the litigants who were who had cases pending, and then refused to recuse themselves once the case was before them, and that's that should be against the law, but. I despise this part of our judicial system, and I wish we would change it, and we're not going to. Yeah, many Australians are astonished to find out that judges are elected in many, many states in the United States. Like you say, what's the thinking behind even having them elected in the first place, John? I'm not sure there is <laughs> rational thinking behind it. Right. I'm not sure that it's grounded on anything that makes any sense. I think it's traditional. It goes back to a, a, a more gentler time when things were not as divided and partisan as they are now. Politics here gets rougher every four years. Every year, I guess, it just gets tougher and rougher and more partisan. And at the the state level, it's very uh, unusual for a sitting judge to be defeated. Uh, At the federal level, the judges are all appointed for life, which is another problem. Mm. They don't face re-election, which, which, you know, I like that, but no one should have a lifetime appointment. Or look at our Supreme Court. Those are all federal judges. We call them Article Three judges from Article Three of our Constitution. For some reason, they can serve until they die, and that, that's not good. They, there needs to be some kind of term limit, uh, you know, to get these people off the courts. And, and there's, you know, there's several thousand federal judges across the country right now at different levels, trial judges, appellate judges, Supreme Court judges on the federal level, at the federal level, that are all appointed for life. That's not all. That's a better system uh, because generally you get better judges, but I don't like the lifetime appointment. But for the state judges, uh, it's just a traditional approach to electing, you know, democracy. We need to vote for everybody. That's, that, that's where it came from years ago. And we started electing judges and prosecutors. We elect prosecutors, which, again, is not a good idea. Years ago, John, I had an interview with uh, Justin Brooks, who's from the Innocence Project in California. Tell me how you got involved with the Innocence Project in the United States. It goes back to a book I wrote 15 years ago, a book called The Innocent Man, which is the only true story I've written. And the book was inspired by the story of a guy who was my age, my same background, religion, everything, who was sent to death row by his hometown. He was framed for a murder in a small town in Oklahoma. And he um, came within five days of being executed uh, after being on death row for a number of years for a crime he had nothing to do with. He was mentally ill and he got some help after he, his life was spared by a federal judge. A very brave federal judge intervened and saved his life. And he's still in prison. And he heard about DNA testing it was brand new. It was 1995. And he saw a TV show about DNA testing and he, he contacted a lawyer. And one thing led to the other. They finally arranged. It took four years. They finally arranged for him to be tested by DNA, and he was um, completely exonerated of the rape murder of a young woman. And the DNA testing nailed the real killer. And the real killer was someone who knew the victim and was the last person seen alive with the victim the night she left a honky-tonk, a nightclub, a lounge. And the police were too stupid to put the case together and, and totally incompetent at every level and they screwed up. They botched the whole case. But anyway, they put Ron Williamson, my guy, in prison. And I read about him. And so I took off to Oklahoma to write this book. I'd never written nonfiction before. And um, so I pursued the story for 18 months and and wrote it and published it. And well, once the book came out, um, you know, it got a lot of attention. And the Innocence Project in New York asked me if I would serve on the board and I said, yes, the, the research and writing of that story took me into the world of wrongful convictions, a place I had never really spent much time before. I never really thought about it. I practiced law for 10 years. I had a lot of clients who were, were criminals and are charged with crimes and who pled guilty and or went to trial or whatever, went to prison. I had all, you know, I had all different types of clients and cases. And uh, I never had a client. I never had one single client 
I thought uh, was wrongfully convicted. It just didn't happen where I practiced law uh, because the cops were straight. The judges ruled over the courts and the prosecutors played it straight. And, you know, it was a good system. And as it is in most jurisdictions, uh, but there are a lot of bad ones that I realize. And there are thousands of innocent people in prison in America. Yeah, like like how big is this, the scale of this, the extent when it comes to wrongful convictions? Well, it's pretty staggering. Uh, no one, it's impossible to know because no one has the time or the money to go back and study all the convictions because there are millions of them. We have 2.3 million people locked up right now. That's the highest rate of incarceration in the world. And that's a whole different set of issues, how we have so many nonviolent people locked up and why. And that's a book I'm going to write one day, Mass Incarceration. So we have 2.3. And there's some pretty decent studies that estimate between 2% and 10% uh, are wrongfully convicted. Well, that's what, between 45,000 and 200,000. That's a lot of people. And uh, and we know through the work at the Innocence Project that uh, there are just a lot of people in prison that we were trying to get out. Some will never get out. Uh, some they won't get out because a lot a lot of crimes do not involve DNA testing. There's no there's nothing left at the crime scene. There's no semen, blood, skin, water, hair that can be tested. Uh, and so those are very difficult cases to to unravel and to prove innocence. Uh, but that's the kind of work we do. And we have a big, a big office in New York. We, we litigate from coast to coast. We take cases from all 50 states. In 25 years, we've had 375 DNA exonerations. Uh, and, and that's clear biological proof that we, you know, our, 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 man, our man is uh, innocent. I think there may be one woman involved in that number, but almost all men. And that's, that's the tip of the iceberg. We have so much work to do and we uh, you know, we labor away, raising money to to hire lawyers, investigators to, to to litigate and try to get our clients out of prison. It's it's frustrating work. Uh, you know, it's, it's and, and in this country. It's not that difficult to send somebody to send an innocent man to prison. And that happens all the time. It's virtually impossible to get one out once he's there. It's very, very hard to get him out, especially if there's no DNA testing. And so that's those are the battles we fight every day. We we fight, you know, we we have clients on death row right now. Of the 375 we have exonerated, uh, several of those were on death row, sent there to die by juries and judges and prosecutors, and they were completely innocent. It's the kind of work that is frustrating, it's frightening, but it's also exhilarating when you are able to walk out a client after 20 or 30 years in prison uh, for somebody else's time. It's uh, it's really hard to turn that off at night when you're trying to go to bed. The idea of an innocent person being executed by the state is particularly horrifying. The man you wrote your book about, Ronald Williamson, how close did he get to being executed wrongfully for this crime of murder and rape? He came within five days and oh, God. He, by the end he was out of his mind. He'd, he'd lost 100 pounds and uh, was, you know, it was really crazy not getting any mental health help on death row. A uh, pretty conservative federal judge in Oklahoma. He did not have a lot of patience with lawsuits filed by our prisoners to get out. But his staff, uh, one young lady in particular, kept reading Ron's case and reading and reading and reading. And she became convinced that Ron, she, she wasn't convinced Ron was innocent. She was convinced that Ron did not get a fair trial. And she took the case around the office and she was, she was not to be denied. She, she leaned on all of her colleagues, and she finally convinced all of them. The clock was ticking loudly because the, the date was set for the execution. And the, the clerks and, and lawyers in the office finally uh, marched into the judge's chambers one day and shut the door and said, they said well, you've got to listen to us. We don't know if Ron Williamson is innocent, but we know he did not get a fair trial. We want you to stop this execution right now. It's five days away. They had a very long, spirited uh, discussion, and the judge finally agreed. He said, I think you're right. I, I don't think justice was served here. And I interviewed the judge years, years later when I was writing the book. I went to his home in rural Oklahoma. We had, a, we had lunch together and had a good visit. And I asked him, I said, well, you know, at that time in Oklahoma, the way the courts worked, if you had said no, 
to Ron, his lawyers would have appealed immediately to the appellate court above you. And that would have taken that they would have stopped the election. I mean, the execution. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. That would have taken too long. The, the, the appeals to the 10th Circuit in Denver would have taken too long. And in the meantime, Ron would have been executed. And so that's how close he came to being killed. And uh, that's that's terrifying. And we, you know, we, we, we have executed innocent people in America in the last 50 years. I think the question a lot of people ask that's terribly confusing is, maybe this is a bit naive, this question, but why do people confess under questioning to murders that they haven't done, could not possibly have done, John? Yeah, that's a tough question. It really... Uh... It really is hard to deal with when you when you have a false confession case. Not everybody is as emotionally grounded as you, me, the next guy, as we think we are. And you don't know what you might do in the basement of the police department after 10 hours of nonstop interrogation from two or three different policemen who are veteran interrogators who know all the dirty tricks and are allowed by our laws to use dirty tricks into getting you to confess. And they break you down. It's just, it's a breakdown. They break your will, your spirit. And uh, I've talked to some of these young men who've been through this and it is a horrifying experience. And once the interrogation is that most of them finally confess just to get the damn interrogation over with. They want to go back to their cells and, and try to regroup. The next morning, they, the next day, they always recant. It's too late. When, once you confess, you're going to be convicted because the question you just asked me, no, people just do not believe, jurors do not believe we would ever, ever confess uh, to something we didn't do. Uh, there are professional interrogators, military-style interrogators who do not use torture. Uh, they use fear. Uh, who can break you down in a matter of, you know, a couple of hours. Uh, there's some, there's, you know, stories about these people. Most small town cops are not that sophisticated, but they do, every police department you know, of any size has a, the go-to guy to get a confession. And they'll bring him in after four or five hours of badgering and all that. And they, 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 there's no more physical abuse, supposedly. There's no, you can't abuse uh, a prisoner anymore, but it, you know, it still happens. Uh, and it's just a total breakdown. I, I'm dealing with a young man in Oklahoma who's been in prison for 36 years. He's the last of the ones I wrote about in the innocent man who's still in prison. The other four, two murders, four guys, the other three have gotten out. He's still in prison again after 36 years. And, uh, he confessed and he told me that, uh, the confession he gave in no way matches anything remotely near the physical evidence once it was finally put together. Um, He said after, you know, after 14 hours of interrogation nonstop, uh, he was 20 years old and not very sophisticated. He said uh, the cops kept suggesting, you know, facts, suggesting methods, suggesting places where the body might be, that kind of stuff. And he got he, he he got confused. He made some mistakes. And once you make a mistake, they beat you over the head with that. And and he said, finally, he said, finally, I just said, OK, I'm going to tell them what they want to hear, because tomorrow when they go check the facts, they're going to realize I'm just lying. And that's not unusual. Yeah, you know, I, I, I had one young man, different case. One young man said he said I would have confessed to killing my mother to get out of that room. And that's the that's the intense abuse that they are put through and the intense pressure. And of the 375 exonerations by DNA we have with the Innocence Project in New York, 25 percent, 25 percent involve false confessions. Uh, John, you had a childhood in the Old South, in rural Arkansas, in parts of Tennessee and other places as well. I remember hearing that the American poet, uh, the Georgian poet, George Dawes Green, saying that this is where the, the whole thing of the moth came from. He said there was a culture in the rural south of storytelling on the porch. That's where he got the title from. The moth is the thing that's sort of zinging around the, the light bulb on the porch while people tell stories. Were you exposed to that culture of storytelling as a kid? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was very much a part of my childhood. Uh, we were in the cotton patch, as, as we say. We were cotton farmers. My father was, my grandfather was. The first seven years of my life was on a cotton farm in Arkansas. And um, very much a part of our uh, daily lives was in the summertime. In fall, we were harvesting cotton was to work the fields all day and then after dinner go to the porch and um, turn on the radio to get the uh, St. Louis Cardinal baseball game out of St. Louis, which was a nightly ritual and and one we never missed, and to uh, tell stories and to listen to my grandfather and father, even my mother. Sometimes a cousin or an uncle would stop by and there was no television back then. 1960, there was no television where we lived. Some people had them. That's how remote it was. The stories were just uh, a matter of pride in being able to spin a yarn, to be able to Mm -hmm. tell a great story. After I'd published, I don't know, probably 15 books, I wanted to write a story that was not, had nothing to do with the law, no lawyers. I wanted to write a childhood memoir, and it's called A Painted House. It came out in about, I guess it was about 20 years ago. And I wanted to take all these stories that I'd heard when I was a kid and even my, my whole life uh, told by my father and grandfather and at least uh, accumulate them, get them in one place, put them in one book uh, while my parents were still alive so they could help me remember all the stories. And that's, they, they all came out in a painted house. So I was able to get them memorialized in a book uh, you know, sometime back. But, yeah, it's, it's just... Um, I'm not much of a storyteller, uh, but also I spent a lot of time in courtrooms when I was a very, very young lawyer. And a lot about a lot of a lot of trying a case or defending someone or, or, or prosecuting a, a plaintiff's case is the narrative. And because you're trying to convince a jury, you're trying to convince 12 people. It's very important to be able to communicate and to tell uh, your version of the facts, to tell a story. So that was where the storytelling came in handy. Was there a culture of listening as well? I, I say this because there was a similar culture of storytelling and listening in country Australia until, until the arrival of TV as, as, as well, where it was understood you had it was it was good to be a good storyteller, but you were also expected to to be a good listener as well. Well, especially for children, we, we live in a pretty strict Southern Baptist disciplined uh, culture where children were not you were to be seen and not heard. It was okay to talk a little bit, but not much. And uh, we just, that was ingrained in, in me and my siblings as children. You, you, you really thought about speaking uh, in the presence of adults because that, that was considered rude. And I, I guess that goes hand in hand with listening. You, you, you sure were not encouraged to tell stories as a child. Uh, that, that never happened. Uh, not that I probably couldn't tell a good story as a child. It's, it's, it, t- it took a while to learn how to do that. Uh, but yeah, I guess so. But I never, you know, nobody listens anymore because of television. So, so I, it doesn't matter anymore. You were in Mississippi for so many years, very beautiful part of the world, mostly rural, has the highest African-American population per capita in the U.S., I think. It has been the scene of so many critical battles in the civil rights movement, which were probably going on in your childhood. How much of that conflicted history and culture do you do you imbibe growing up in a place like Mississippi? It's very much a part of growing up because of this almost ridiculous glorification of the Civil War that is so ingrained in every Southern kid my age and even before. I don't think it's that way now. But it was this glorious lost cause that we all grew up believing and and we we worshipped the heroes of those battles, you know, for, for many years and grieved over the fact that we lost the war. And we we didn't stop to see it as a war to to further white supremacy, which that's all it was. It was it was a continuation of slavery. Now, because of protests from so many uh, African Americans, because of protests from so many white Americans who are saying we should, you know, this is, that, that was the wrong way to teach history. We, 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 we have to look at history now and see how it really happened. You can't justify 6,000 lynchings 
of young black men over a hundred year period in the deep South. You can't justify that. You can't ignore that. It really happened. And so I, I hope we're taking a long, hard look at our history and, you know, getting away from this ridiculous uh, love of the civil war that I grew up with. I was, it was ingrained in me as a child. I went to, went to civil war battlefields as a kid and marched around, not marched, but hiked around, you know, re- replaying the, the battlefields. And, and that was great fun. We all, we, we grew up that way uh, without really stopping to think about what the war really meant. On air, online, and on the ABC Listen app. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. You can subscribe to the Conversations podcast. To find out more, just head to abc.net.au slash conversations. John, before you went to law school, tell me about the kind of odd jobs you took on to make a living before you were able to actually become a lawyer. Well, we, we had to work. I mean, when I was a kid, uh, when I was five years old, we were in the cotton fields. And uh, we got paid a little bit for that. But that's, you know, farm plant families, everybody had to work like that. Luckily, when I was seven years old, we got off the farm. Uh, my father had finally lost all of his money and lost all everything. So we fled in the middle of the night uh, to get off the farm. And that was the single greatest event in my life at the time, at the age of seven, didn't realize it, but getting off the farm and getting away from that, that kind of a lifestyle because we, they, they, we could not survive. The first job I got paid, I was uh, cutting grass, mowing grass. I got paid for some of that. Uh, I got paid a dollar an hour at a local nursery to water rose bushes. That was probably the most boring job I ever had. <laughs> uh, I would always get a summer construction job. My dad would always help me get a job. Uh, one, one summer, it was probably the worst job, was laying asphalt on a highway paving crew in Mississippi, where it's 100 degrees anyway, and you got the asphalt coming down. That was pretty brutal. Bulldozer operator. I finally got tired of construction. I paid for, I paid for two-thirds of my uh, college through summer jobs and saving money. And about half a law school, because we were just always expected. My parents, there were five kids. My parents expected all of us to go to college. They helped as much as they could. They did not get to go to college. They wanted us to, and we just we just had to work. We worked odd jobs wherever we could find them. Even in college, I worked odd jobs. I was always looking for another job. In college, it was to buy more beer and pizza and you know, change. <laughs> Uh, but you know, that was very much a part of college. But uh, all kinds of jobs. I can't even think of all the jobs I did. John, I understand the first time you were really praised as a fiction writer was by your law professor on a legal exam. How did that happen? Well, I blew the exam. In law school, um, we have this really unusual way of grading law students. You're in a class for a semester, September through December, the first year of law school. And you go to class three times a week. And the professor who's taught the material for years, you know, I had, I had really good professors. And they know the material very well. They call on you in class to discuss a certain case that you're studying from the case book, an old case. And it, it's very much a part of the law school routine for them to rough you up and embarrass you or trip you up, whatever. <laughs> they don't try to make a fool out of you because they're, they're trying to make you tough. And so that goes on for three or four months until the end. You have one exam. You have one four-hour exam per class. And that, that's your only grade for the class for the whole year. And so I was taking a, a class one time, and I was taking the final exam. Law school exams are also famous for being just totally uh, these outrageous plots that would never happen anywhere in the world. But you're you, you, in real life, you got to figure out how to unravel the legal issues, and this goes on and on. And so uh, I got down to the last, very last problem, and I, I was worn out, exhausted. I, I had no idea what the problem was about. And so I just started writing about the characters. I took the characters in the, in the legal problem and I started writing uh, a story about them. It had nothing to do with the legal problem because I didn't understand the legal problem. 
And uh, I wrote three or four pages of that and finally turned the exam in, confident once again that I had blown the exam and was going to flunk out of law school. And there goes my big dream. And when I, when I, when I got the exam a month later, uh, I had a decent grade to my surprise. <laughs> and the law professor said at the very bottom, on the last page, the last problem, he said, um, he said, although, although you missed most of the legal issues involved with this problem, you have a real flair for fiction. <laughs> so we kept in touch and have kept in touch 40 something years later. Ten years after that exam, my first novel came out in 1989. He called me. He said, um, do you remember your first exam, your first semester exam? And I said, yes. He said, and what did I tell you? I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm very proud of you. So we, we've been buddies ever since. So you got your law degree and became a trial lawyer representing people in very low incomes. How does defending regular poor people prepare you for life as a writer? There are so many aspects of practicing law that can really prepare you for life as a writer because lawyers see uh, some really weird stuff. You see people who are in trouble. You see people who have really screwed up their lives. You see big lawsuits with big companies, corporations. You see a lot of good stuff. And most lawyers are pretty good storytellers. And uh, there's no shortage of crazy cases, crazy clients. So many books I have written uh, were inspired by something that happened back then. So uh, uh, a case I saw, a case I heard about, a case I was involved in, something another lawyer said. Uh, I still, still remember so much, and and I've I've gleaned so many of those ideas to use in novels. So it's a great, it's a great. Uh, sort of a grooming place for, for stories. Most lawyers are, are not good novelists uh, because they get caught up in the legal ease, the fancy writing. And they, most, most lawyers who try to write want to impress you as the reader with how much they know about the law. And very few writers write clearly. Uh, I realized that fresh out of law school, I was really frustrated with the legalese, the, the, the verbosity of ideas and words that, that were unnecessary. And I just, I said, I'm going to write clearly. John Steinbeck is one of my favorite literary figures. And he, and I always love John Steinbeck because he writes so, he wrote so clearly. And I've always driven, if that's the right word, to, to, to write as clearly as possible. Uh, and I, I still do that. You know, I'll, I'll write a sentence now, and if it doesn't sound right, I'll chunk it because, it, you know, I'm not going to try to fix it if it doesn't sound right. I'll try again. And I read that sentence out loud two or three times, almost every sentence, especially the dialogue, to make sure it's smart, it's, it, it's clear, it, it makes sense. It's, you know, so I'm, I'm always working hard to, to write clearly, unlike what most lawyers do. You spent some time in the Mississippi legislature as a Democrat when such things were possible in, uh, in Southern politics. This sort of reminds me of uh, talking to George Saunders, who similarly had a series of different careers before he lit upon being a writer. And that made him and has made him very grateful for having discovered that profession and for being successful in it. Are you like that too, John? Sure. I tell aspiring writers, especially young ones, students, no one finishes college and starts writing. No one turns 25 and starts writing or getting published. Uh, You've got to have a life. Uh, You've got to have a career. You've got to have um, something that you find emotionally and financially uh, rewarding, satisfying. You got to pay the bills. Uh, You've also got to travel and do things, see and, and do different jobs and see other places and meet other people and you've got to, you got to live for a while. You got to, you know, you got to taste a defeat and the bitterness of setbacks and lost love and, and all, you know, all the, all the things that we humans go through and do to each other. You've got to, you got to taste that before you can write about it. And very, very few, it's pretty rare that you see a novelist in this country published before the age of 30. It happens for the good ones. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but, uh, I think George was even older, quite a bit older than that when he first started getting published because some of my favorite writers are people who've had, uh, you know, really strange, bizarre, colorful lives and they've seen it all and, and they love to write about it. I, I think it's very important to 
you know, get out of the office, get out of the classroom, get out, you know, go live and work and travel and, and suffer. You know, nobody wants to suffer, but that that's part of life. And you, you got to do that to be able to write about it. I think you said your first book, A Time to Kill, which came out of a particularly gruesome case that you, you, you read about. It took you three years to write that. And you were married with two little kids at the time. How are you squeezing in time to write that as your first book? The only way, the only way I could do it was to get up an hour earlier or an hour and a half earlier in the morning and go to the office. I would, I would set my alarm clock for five o'clock and I would roll out of bed. And there were so many days I didn't want to. My wife thought I was crazy. And I would shower quickly. My office was five minutes away, drive to the office make the coffee. And my rule on a normal day, five days a week, my rule was to sit down at my desk with the first cup of strong coffee, black coffee, and write the first word at 530. And that's what I did for five years. It took three years to write A Time to Kill. And by then, I was very much in the habit of doing that every day. And, and, and A Time to Kill and I didn't, I never broke stride. I went straight from there into the firm. I thought the firm was going to be something that was uh, possibly more commercially accessible, you know, more popular, more maybe it would sell. Over a five year period, I wrote those two books, you know, with that kind of a routine. When the firm uh, came out 30 years ago, March of, of uh, 91, kind of hard to believe, the firm was just, you know, an overnight uh, big book. And that took the pressure off. I stopped waking up at five in the morning. Put it that way. I started. I started, I started sleeping till six. And so, uh, uh, but even today, I mean, you know, old, old habits are hard to break. And and today, it's still six or six thirty in the morning. I love to get up and I still treasure the first few hours of each day in my little office where there's no phones, no fax, no internet, no music, uh, nothing but you know. A, dark room with a small window and a cup of coffee. And I get to create these stories that, that people uh, still enjoy. And that's still gratifying to me. There's no doubt that writing first thing in the morning, like really early in the morning, is absolutely the best time to write. And I wonder why that is. Do you think it's because the subconscious mind has been working away during the night and solving the problems that you ended up with at the end of the previous day? I can only speak for myself. I don't carry the problems around with me. If I quit at noon, I try to quit between 11 and 12 when I'm in a real good spot. And Hemingway said he would stop halfway through a great sentence. <laughs> so he, he would he'd have the good sentence and he would just stop because he knew what it was. He would think about it and come back the next day and it was easy to pick it up. Uh, I'm not quite that way, but I, I like to stop at a good spot with, with, so I can leave with no problems. And, and so I won't be plagued with the idea of uncertainties until the next day. And I really, uh, once, once I stop and I'm, the, the morning's gone and it's time to move on with the rest of the day, I, I, I don't really think about exactly where I am. I'm always thinking about the story and the plot and what might come next. I do that driving down the highway or, you know, whatever I'm doing. The next morning when I start again, I go back and read what I wrote the day before. It's usually about a thousand words. And I go through that very slowly and edit, do a lot of editing then. But go, reading what you did the day before kind of gets you back into the rhythm of the story. And good suspense is, uh, is, uh, is a lot of good plotting. You've got you to keep the plot going and the subplots kind of circling in the air to make the story move. And, and that's all, you know, that's all a question of, of timing and rhythm and, you know, which subplot comes next and so that that's all that just seems to work better at seven o'clock in the morning than any other time of the day like you say the second book you wrote the firm that was the one that was a massive massive bestseller i went back to the firm before uh, just before we, we had this conversation and I, and i went yeah it's an exciting story with you know there's, there's gangsters in it there's there's murder and mayhem and there's uh, you know, sudden riches coming to the main character. But it struck me going back to it that the real heart of the story is that it's really about a young man's whole life and how it becomes the plaything of both this corrupt law firm and the FBI. That's the emotional engine of the story, isn't it? Uh, sure. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, you know, we spend a lot of time 
with Mitch uh, backfilling into where he came from. And he was a poor kid from Kentucky and uh, with, a, with a brain, uh, you know, really smart and got into Harvard Law and um, started going down the, the road to which he barely recovered. But no, it's, it's you know, his, his family's tragic. His brother's in prison. Yeah, I, I wanted Mitch to be a, a, you know, a very sympathetic character. But you, you have to have that almost always to, to write to write a good book or to certainly to write good suspense, you've got, you've got to have a very sympathetic character that, that your readers are going to care about because when you get them in trouble and that's always inevitable, you want, you want the, the reader to really care about what's going to happen to Mitch. And, uh, but you know, honestly, that was so long ago. I'm not sure I knew what I was doing when I started writing the firm in 1987 or whenever it was 88. I, cause it was so long. And I, again, I had never, I had written one book, but it has not been published then. And, and I, I don't know what I was doing back then. I got lucky. <laughs> I know you're a fan of John le Carre, and he said a few times that when he created characters, he would sort of create the shell of someone that he needed for the story and then stuff bits of himself into it, as well as observations <laughs> of other people. But that was the thing. And I'm quoting him here. He said, all fictional characters are amalgams. They all spring from much deeper wells and they're apparent counterparts in life all in the end are remolded in the writer's imagination until they're probably closer to his own nature than to anyone else's what do you think well very well said by one of my literary heroes who died almost a year ago december uh, of last year he was 89 i was hoping i could finally meet him post-covid uh, he had a huge impact in, in on my career with a book he wrote published in 1980 called Little Drummer Girl. And uh, I read his earlier stuff. When I read Little Drummer Girl, it was one of those books that just, you know, resonate with, with, with me and it inspired me to try to write the, the really the best suspense, the smartest suspense I could possibly come up with, because that's what that book is among many other things. Uh, you know, some, some characters you, you spend a lot of time with, Obviously, your narrator, your protagonist, your hero, your heroine is always going to have the voice of the writer. You, yeah, yeah, I don't know how you, any writer could throw their voice into another person and let that person carry the ball for 500 pages. I have to watch that. I have friends who I have really close friends who tell me they, they can they read my books and they can hear me talking, the way I talk, the, the words I use. And I'm not sure that's always good. I, I, I don't want that to happen always. Um, some characters, some characters are, you know, minor characters. You don't have, you don't have time. When you write suspense, you're thinking about turning pages. You're thinking about the plotting, the pacing, the, the speed of the story. That's what I think of. That's what I want readers to do. I can't always spend a lot of time developing the characters. I'm not that good at it. Uh, it's not one of my strengths. Uh, is, is spending a lot of time fleshing out people uh, and also places and and maybe, you know, relationships between people. I, I, I get bored real fast when I'm supposed to do that. So uh, I don't always spend enough time with the characters. But the principal characters, you know, you've got to – your reader has got to know – your reader's got to get inside their head and, and know how they're thinking. And that's, that's where the challenge is. How can you make your person – your protagonist so uh, real that the reader can almost predict what he or she's going to do next. John, you were once a supporter of the death penalty when you were younger. What changed your mind? I was on death row in Mississippi in 1994, researching a book called The Chamber. Uh, and I'd been there several times. It's At that time, I lived in Mississippi. And the state penitentiary... I was two hours from my house. So I'd made the drive many times to research the book. I had talked to uh, guards, the prison officials, the uh, prison lawyers, some of the inmates. I talked to uh, the executioner. Uh, back then, it was a uh, death by uh, gas chamber, not lethal injection. It was the old-fashioned gas chamber, they, which was a big round tube with windows. They would strap you inside and and release the gas. And that's, that's what they were using back then. And um, I knew more about the gas chamber than, you know, <laughs> I should have known. And uh, back then in Mississippi, it's different now, but right before the 
condemned man is taken into the uh, death room. That's that's what it was called with the gas chamber in the center of it. Uh, he would spend the last hour in a holding room, which is a small cell next to the death room. And he would, he would sit there for an hour with the chaplain, if he so chose, or, and or his lawyer, if he so chose, or nobody. I was sitting in the, uh, in the holding room and on, on a little bunk bed, and I was sitting with the um, chaplain. The chaplain was a retired Baptist minister, an old guy who had been, been serving the men on death row for a long time volunteered who wasn't paid for it. And uh, we were talking about issues of retribution and issues of faith and closure and, you know, pretty heavy conversation given where we were. Room was dark and death row was quiet. And um, he said, John, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said, yes, I'm a Christian. He said, do you think that Jesus would approve of what we do here? And I sort of <laughs> hesitated, and I said, uh, no, he, he would not. He, he preached forgiveness, not retribution. And he said, you're exactly right. That's why this is wrong. What we do here is wrong. At that moment, you know, I flipped, did a 180, and realized that uh, I'd been wrong my entire life about the death penalty. Uh, if it's, if it's, we, can all, we can all agree that it's wrong to kill. So why do we allow the state to kill in our names? You can't justify it. Just finally, John, I'm going to end with one of those great big, ugly, cosmic questions that interviewers like to end such interviews on. I'm asking this because you are a man of faith. Uh, Martin Luther King once said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I really hope that's true. Do you think it's true or is it just a nice thing to say? I believe it's true because I want to believe it's true. Uh, I want to believe that uh, in the end, right will always prevail over wrong, good over evil, justice over injustice. Um, I'm not sure I see my country or much of the world bending toward justice these days. Uh, right, right now, I think we're in a real moral quandary in this country about where we are and where we're going, who we are, where we're going. Uh, we're, so, we're so divided and feelings are so raw and political and ugly and there's not much room for uh, important, decent conversations. Uh, we see it at every level. Uh, so, I, you know, it's, it's a disturbing time here. And the future is, um, could be even more disturbing if um, the wrong people regain power and, and have an agenda. That's, you know, that's, yeah, it's, it's very troublesome. The wrong people were in power and they cared nothing about injustice. They cared nothing about the suffering of those people who uh, are weaker and poor than we are. So, I want to believe that. I want to believe we're headed in the right direction because to admit otherwise is to is to admit uh, failure and to live in a world that's very frightening. John, I appreciate your time. It's been lovely speaking with you. Thank you so much. A lot of fun. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. John Grisham is the author of The Judges List. I'm Richard Feidler. Thanks for listening. Hit subscribe for more or try out the ABC Listen app for thousands of other podcasts all ad-free. 